a monument in Montgomery, Alabama, honors those who led the civil rights movement, who followed a dream in an effort to change America. As a boy, our new explorer witnessed this struggle firsthand. Now he's pursuing new breakthroughs in heart surgery by pioneering the implanting of defibrillators. Dr. Levi Watkins is giving victims of heart attacks another chance at life. Raised on a dream, he's now helping others fulfill their own. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis, and these may look familiar. They're used by paramedics and in operating rooms to shock a heart back to life if it stops. But it's a little difficult to carry this machine around with you all the time in case of an emergency. Our new explorer works with a much more advanced idea. They've taken the power of this machine and placed it in this small electronic device that can be implanted in the body to sense when a heart stops and start it again. It's enabled our new explorer, Dr. Levi Watkins of Johns Hopkins Hospital, to chart a whole new course in cardiac surgery. Baltimore, Maryland, the corridors of Johns Hopkins Hospital, a world-class institution considered one of the best. I got through all the radiology. 70-year-old Bill Rosberg wouldn't argue. After separate surgeries for heart failure and cancer, he's a Hopkins regular. My wife can take you around this hospital better than any guy you, you have. But we love this place, seriously. No matter what it is. Uh, I don't know what they do here, but uh, they make you feel very comfortable. He's here today because two weeks ago, his heart stopped. I'll see if you can run Mrs. Rosberg down. Dr. Levi Watkins, a heart surgeon at Johns Hopkins, is going to try to make sure it doesn't happen again. His specialty is giving patients another chance at life. Bill Rosberg almost missed that chance, as his wife explains. My son had come up from Charlottesville and it's Father's Day weekend. And we were Father's greeting Day each weekend. yes, we were greeting each other out on the driveway and my husband was in the basement in his shop playing solitaire mm -hmm. and he heard us mm -hmm. from the driveway. Mm -hmm. So he came upstairs. So it wasn't much time because he came up, he decided to get a glass of water on the sink board mm -hmm. and we came through the greeted each other and the two grandchildren then came through the family room mm -hmm. and I could see his arm lying mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. So he, mm -hmm. and at that point he was, and he, the glass everywhere, but he was not cut. He did not strike his mm -hmm. head. He really mm -hmm. was very lucky. The human heart under normal circumstances beats steadily, about 72 beats per minute. But for many heart patients, the scarring of previous heart attacks could lead to sudden cardiac arrhythmia. It's a short circuit within the heart that throws it off course into a pulsating frenzy. Blood pressure falls, the body's pump shuts down. By applying a jolt of electricity to the heart, doctors can shock it back to its proper rhythm. Without intervention, most people die within minutes, but those who get help can be pulled from sudden death. A team of emergency medical technicians conducts its rescue mission delivering an electric current to the heart with the paddles of a defibrillator. For the fortunate, the heart returns to normal and the episode ends. Got to get you down there. In a few hours, Dr. Watkins will implant a miniaturized defibrillator in Bill Rosberg. The risk of his heart stopping unexpectedly again is great. If it does, the defibrillator will jolt it back into action. Now where we are with this device. Much smaller. Much smaller. Just, I mean, you can see the, the mm -hmm. difference is much smaller. This is both the doctor and the powerhouse. Mm. It can make the diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia, and it also has the power. Now, they're comparable, 
the power source sits here. The, uh, these are the paddles, if you will. These patches compare to these. To these. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So this goes on the chest, this goes on the heart. Dr. Watkins has a long history with the defibrillator. He's performed more than 650 implants since 1980, more than any other heart surgeon. In the 1970s, he worked closely with the inventor of the device, Dr. Michelle Morosky of Baltimore Sinai Hospital. It took years of research, refinement, and experimentation before the first defibrillator implant in a human was performed in 1980. The lead surgeon, Dr. Levi Watkins. The procedure was marked by both triumph and tension. Actually, the first implant fell on the floor. The nurses and all were so nervous for the first implant. When I asked for the device, it went to the floor. So the second device was given to me and we implanted it in this lady. The most notable feature of the first implant was, as you saw, we have to stop the heart to see if the device will bring it back. And in all of our training, we are taught to start the heart, not to stop it. Yes. And so for the first time, I guess ever, and certainly for the first time in uh, my experience, we, we stopped it. And we had to wait until the device fired. And in this particular patient, it, it took 35 seconds. Oh my goodness. And it seemed like that was the longest 35 seconds in a lifetime. Yes. And we were about to abandon the uh, concept of the internal defibrillator and go to that external device mm -hmm. that you... And in fact, I had grabbed the paddles of the external device, getting ready to try to shock her back, when the internal implantable device fired and brought her back. Wow. And that was the first uh, human implant and the first human restoration, automatic restoration by the device. Is she still living? Yes, she is. Really? Yes, she is. What a success yes, story. Yes, she is. Back at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Watkins will try for another success. But to do so, he must turn off Bill Rosberg's heart. It's 11 a.m., and Bill Rosberg is in the cardiac catheter lab. Cardiologists carefully thread defibrillator wires into a vein. Their target is the patient's heart. Three hours from now, Dr. Watkins will connect the other ends of the wires to the defibrillator, which will be permanently placed in the abdomen. For the rest of Mr. Rosberg's life, the implant will continually pick up electric impulses from the heart, monitoring it for abnormal rhythm. Without the implant, the likelihood of a patient living five years is zero. Now with the implant and techniques pioneered by Dr. Watkins, life expectancy is 10 years. The only thing we have to do is uh, check this electrode out, make sure it's okay. Before surgery, Dr. Watkins gives a final briefing to his chief resident, who will assist him in the operating room. Prep him out all the way down in case we have to resuscitate him with the external device. He makes a strong effort at mentoring, perhaps because of the leader who guided him. In 1955, Martin Luther King Jr. had just moved to Montgomery, Alabama taking the pulpit at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He was only 25. Among his congregation were Levi Watkins Sr. and his family. Dr. Watkins would soon become president of Alabama State University. Levi Jr. and his brothers and sisters were destined to live in a special place and time, to witness a wildfire that would sweep the South and eventually America. The tinder for the blaze of protest was Montgomery a city filled with racial tension and divided in two, one black, one white. For the whites, there was privilege, but for a black child in Montgomery... Couldn't go to the swimming pool, the zoo, the park, the Dairy Queen, the White Tower restaurants, the Paramount movie theaters. None of those things were available, so back then at that time, it seemed uh, not a great place to grow up, but in retrospect, it was a wonderful place to grow up. And what a time and piece of history. Yes, yes. And as a youngster, he was surrounded by the struggle. To Levi, it was a lifelong call to action. 
to continue the work of his pastor, the man who led the movement. We are not afraid of the threat of arrest. We are not afraid of police dogs. We are not afraid of the Nazi party or the states' rights party. Because as we march, we know that we do not march alone. Dr. King was not only a great speaker, he was a great preacher. Uh, and I remember the many, many times that I was at his home. We had a little club called the Crusaders Club. Dr. King would bring in all the young boys and try to influence them, and obviously he did, <laughs> he did influence us. But he brought us in his home in the evenings and talked about uh, the concept of God and what that should mean. Dr. King's dream, born in Montgomery, has come true today as Levi Watkins, Jr. operates on Bill Rosberg. The surgical team will use an innovative approach known as the Endotac lead system. It's a closed chest procedure less invasive than the standard open heart approach. The technique was officially approved by the FDA in 1995, and if it works, will allow Bill Rosberg to undergo a major surgical operation with a lot fewer complications. Pick up, Before connecting the generator and leads, the team will conduct a series of tests. They want to make sure that all components are working and to determine the exact amount of energy needed to restart Bill Rosberg's heart. Okay, you got your pacing hooked up, big team. First, the electrodes are tested. We're gonna have the external defibrillator on max. We have to cut this off so that we can shock him in case he doesn't come back. This is the most dramatic step, especially for someone who has just survived cardiac arrhythmia. To find out how much energy it takes to defibrillate the heart, it must first be fibrillated, stopped, just as it was when Bill Rosberg collapsed at home. All eyes focus on the corner screen. The top yellow lines represent EKG, the heart's electrical output. The bottom peaks show blood pressure. Okay, you guys ready? Have at it. Okay, papers on music. 1001, 1002, 1003, off, four. As electric current five, shuts the heart six, down. Seven, eight, nine, ten, Frank. The implant fires. But the heart doesn't respond. Internal rescue at 40 coming. We'll try it again, charge against that 40. Charge the coming. Put this thing on here. Go ahead, again. Get these out of the way. Nope, still 40, again, is not getting them internally. Okay. Okay, externally got them. The implant didn't work. A jolt from the paddles used 10 times the power of the implant. That was 15, and then two internal at 40 didn't get them, so let's go to configuration uh, two. The team must modify its approach, altering the lead system, closing in on the precise power setting. Now, how do you want, uh, what do you want as negative in this second configuration? The trial run on Bill Rosberg's implant continues. There is no substitute test, no way to simulate arrhythmia. They'll have to stop his heart again. Everybody cross their fingers and say their prayer. Okay, induction, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, Frank. Ah, good. Beautiful, okay. beautiful. The implant works. Bill Rusberg's heart is now beating normally. Putting the patient's life on hold, relying on teamwork to bring him back, it's a huge okay. responsibility, and the outcome is never certain. A doctor needs a place to gain perspective, like the waters of Baltimore's harbor. What are the rewards for a surgeon? I think the, the first reward uh, is, is uh, your ability to impact, along with God, in saving uh, life, and I mean not life down the road, but helping to save life immediately. Because, you know, most of my patients know they are lucky. They are lucky to be here. Uh, they know that even before they come. 
so I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I enjoy uh, operating on them. I enjoy uh, loving them. And I try to share myself with them and uh, treat them as if they are my family, which they are. And the family tree has many branches. On the walls of his harbor front home are pictures of many civil rights leaders and renowned performers, all longtime friends of Levi, the late Reverend Dr. Ralph Abernathy, singer Harry Belafonte, former UN ambassador and Atlanta mayor Andrew Young, South African President Nelson Mandela, and Bishop Desmond Tutu. The friendships go deep, rooted in a common cause. And of course, Rosa Parks. One single act of courage. She is a wonderful friend, and she is a patient. Uh, she's doing very well. She's one of the strongest women I have ever met in my life at any age. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks changed the course of history. That afternoon, she rode a Montgomery bus home from work. She sat down. The driver came back and asked her to give her seat to a white man. By the courage of her convictions, she refused to get up and was promptly jailed. Rosa Parks' actions sparked the Montgomery bus boycott and the entire civil rights movement that followed. 10 years after the boycott, Watkins made his own historic contribution to civil rights as the first African-American student to enroll and later graduate from Vanderbilt University Medical School. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is talk Today at Johns Hopkins, his ongoing efforts at African-American recruitment have shown positive results. Since joining the hospital in 1979, African-American medical student enrollment has grown from less than 1% to over 13% well above the national average for medical schools. Levi Watkins' two lives, medicine and civil rights, are inseparable. We saw it when we went home to historic Dexter Avenue Baptist Church with patient Rosa Parks. Real love for a real world is the subject today. Watch these stairs, yeah. Love is informed, and my dear friends, love is intelligent as it moves in the midst of a wolf-like world. Jesus says that love ought to be wise as a serpent. For the Dexter Fellowship, it's a chance for longtime friends to reconnect with Rosa and Levi, a mother of the movement and a child of the cause. For children now in, uh, who might be reading about the bus boycott, could you describe for them um, that day and that moment well, I can remember that uh, we had a very severe legally enforced uh, racial segregation everywhere, and of course it was very disagreeable on the buses. And at the time I was arrested, I was working with the NAACP as a, as a secretary of the senior branch and as advisor to the youth. And when I was arrested, I just felt very much like I had too much to do to be going to jail, but if I had to face that, I would rather do that than to let the uh, segregators and the, those, the powers that be know that we as a people were satisfied with the way we were being treated. Of course, Dr. Watkins would not have been able to go to Vanderbilt were it not for the Civil Rights Movement. Well, listen, I'm glad she sat down because if she hadn't sat down, I wouldn't have been able to stand up. Uh, you're right, Vanderbilt was a segregated institution. If Mrs. Parks hadn't sat down, the whole modern civil rights movement might not have occurred. She did it by herself at that time. But the whole movement, Dr. King, the whole, this church, and many other things came about as a consequence of that. What do you remember about that time? You were a young man growing up. Well, we, we were small. I was a small child. I had my best friend, Norman Walton. His father was in church today. We were all young at that time. Everything seemed to be, um, even though it was segregated, it seemed to be the order of the day. The fact that we couldn't go to Oak Park and all those little places seemed to be uh, the order of the day. But when Dr. King and others started the movement, it became clear that the order of the day was out of order. 
So when I walk into my house every night, the first thing I see is Rosa Parks. And that is a reminder of, uh, of everything I need to do every day. Uh, it is a major part of my life. Um, sudden death, open heart surgery, full professorship, dean, all of those things at Johns Hopkins, I am sure would not have occurred if the people and the relationship here uh, on the wall had not existed. And that's something I will never, ever forget. How are you? Oh, you look beautiful. Really? You look beautiful. The day after surgery, Bill Rosberg is doing well, but his surgeon wants one more test. Now let me tell you what we're going to do before you go home. We need to test it just one more time okay. so you know what it's about in the event it ever goes off. Right. It won't just Appreciate shock it. you. Yeah, it surprise me. Yeah, under control situation, we'll stop your heart one more time and then let the device start it back up. And this is just a test. And we have to do this because you've got the experimental one. But let me assure you, everything worked well and will work well, and you'll be out of here in a short period of time. I think I'm a better heart surgeon because of Montgomery, a better uh, physician because of the struggle. I think sometimes you have to struggle a little bit to appreciate the struggle in other people's lives. And memories of the struggle still hit home. When we returned to Montgomery, we found out that Levi had never been back to Oak Park, the whites-only zoo he had to sneak into as a youngster. All we wanted to do was see the animals. They had great animals and great plants as they are uh, right now. It must have been the most beautiful place in the world in your mind, a forbidden zone here. Yep. You know, that was part of the attraction. It was so pretty and we couldn't go and uh, <laughs> visit. During your life, your young life, was it ever open? Uh, it was never open uh, to me. At the time that uh, they decided to integrate it, I think they closed the park. So I was gone to college by then. I've never been in this park since then. Really? So this is the first time I've actually uh, been in the park as an equal citizen. No kidding. Well, yeah. how does it look to you? Smaller, but still beautiful. This pond is just as pretty. The plants, I don't know what they did with all the animals. But you know what, there are, one of the things that concerns me is that there are a lot of other little oak parks in America. And I hope that we can change uh, them as this park has changed. And I think the beauty of America can be brought out for all people if we do that.